Good afternoon, everyone. We want to thank you for your time today and welcome you to the webinar Invasive Phragmites Road Management that is hosted by the Township of the Archipelago and Georgian Bay Forever and features speakers from the Invasive Phragmites Control Center, the Georgian Bay Land Trust, Georgian Bay Forever, and the Ontario Ministry of Transportation. I would like to begin today by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we, while we are meeting on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. I would also like to acknowledge that the plant we are here to talk about today was brought to this land by ships and the horticultural trade and has caused damage to lands and the medicines they provide. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the First Nations, Inuit and Métis people that call this land home. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we are and how we can each in our own way move forward in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I'm now going to turn the mic over to Reeve Burt Liverance from the Township of the Archipelago. Thank you, Heather, and thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. My name is Burt Liverance, and I have the privilege of being the Reeve for the Township of the Archipelago. Like many of you, our municipality and residents have been battling Phragmites for many years now. I'm happy to say that we have made progress, and these vectors demonstrate that when we focus, we can defeat Phragmites. This photo that's about to be shown is, was taken several years ago in Algonquin Park, where road work was being conducted in the middle of a stand of Phragmites. Roads are one of the spread vectors for Phragmites when we unintentionally spread the plant and seeds along roads and the Phragmites remain untreated and allowed to destroy our infrastructure. Our roads also cross major water watersheds that act as secondary spread vectors. The multitude of roads and waterways combined present us with a daunting task of eradicating Phragmites. We've also learned that Mother Nature does not respect political boundaries. Therefore, it is imperative for us to work together to defeat this invasive species on our roads, in the waters, and wherever Phragmite grows. In the first half, speakers will lay out the threat of the invasive Phragmites pose that poses to the environment. You'll be taken through an example program that works to control this invasive species along the coast of Georgian Bay and a mapping program that lays out its threat to inland wetlands. You'll see that the Phragmites stands on roads and highways have and continue to be pathways of spread of this plant and that there are control methods that you can undertake to stop this environmental problem on the roads. There will be a short break and then there'll be a presentation by the Ontario Ministry of Transportation outlining their current and future efforts to mitigate invasive Phragmites on Ontario highways. The webinar will conclude with further action items that can be done. As you'll have noted, your microphones are turned off. If there are any questions, please put them in the Q&A section. If you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat button and a Q&A please put it in the Q&A section and it's different than the chat feature. While, there may not, while we may not be able to get all the questions uh, sessions planned here, we, we, we will work to get as many uh, questions answered today as possible and follow up with answers on any important questions and subsequent communications. Right now, it is my pleasure to introduce David Sweetnam, the Executive Director of Georgian Bay Forever, 
to talk about their community program to protect coastal wetlands on the east coast of Georgian Bay from invasive Phragmites. Thank you very much, Reeve Liverance. And uh, welcome everybody. Um, we're very happy to be able to make this uh, introductory portion of the presentation to you this morning or this afternoon. Uh, Georgian Bay Forever has been working on uh, the problem of invasive Phragmites in the coastal wetlands of Georgian Bay since about 2011 when we start to put our program together, so almost a decade now. And as Reeve Liverance uh, has just mentioned, we are seeing some uh, success, which I, I do wanna share with you. This is a picture of what we call the Frag Busters program. Our program uh, relies heavily on community volunteers and uh, people coming out to, to actually protect the wetlands, remove this plant. Uh, our program does not uh, use any chemicals since uh, we can't apply chemicals uh, up until recently over the uh, the water. So we had a stem by stem removal process. Um, we've worked over the years on over 711 stands that we've identified. We've had uh, uh, last year about 2,500 hours of uh, cutting time and volunteer uh, donation time. Uh, municipalities on the coastline, uh, the township of the archipelago uh, Township of Georgian Bay and Tay Township have provided financial support for these programs. And, uh, you know, we're spending a significant amount of money uh, over the year. So $75,000 to $100,000, some years up to $125,000 of invested money. And really, since all of the upstream uh, lands and streams are vectors for this uh, spread into Georgian Bay, um, it would be for naught if we don't uh, actually look upstream and have everybody participate in the eradication of this uh, plant. So there, there is a, a you know, significant commitment in the community, both at the municipal government level. Uh, we've had provincial support uh, and federal support for this program, uh, but also you know, the community is really interested in protecting the unique coastal wetlands and also all of the ecosystems uh, that, that rely on them. Um, Janice will talk in more detail. I just want to introduce the idea that Phragmites is not a benign participant in the ecosystem from an infrastructure perspective. It damages uh, road infrastructure. Uh, this was a brand new road bed uh, two years after the new road was put in. Phragmites was already growing up through the asphalt. Image two is a rec representation of the threat to biodiversity. These plants uh, have no um, predators that, uh, that prey on them. And they also release uh, a toxin into the soil, which actually causes our native plants to poison themselves. So it really does become a monoculture, uh, impenetrable to many of the life uh, forms that require uh, access to and from the water. It does have a, a high impact uh, on our shorelines. And uh, also it's a very demanding plant once it gets established to actually cut and haul away and dispose of. So there is significant cost uh, to non-vigilance. The resources uh, that it takes, you can see kind of the, the process that we use here. Uh, the year, first year, we usually go out and, and map sites, uh, identify them. Uh, then do an assessment of which uh, areas we, we can get resources to, to remove. Um, we then organize those cuts and uh, get community volunteers sorted out so that they can come out and help us and, and the equipment needed to haul the material away. And then over the years, we've experimented with a variety of ways of uh, actually disposing of the plant, including uh, burning in early years, which was a, a fairly uh, time intensive and, and not overly productive for our program. Uh, as well as bundling the plant up and just letting it dry out or taking it to a municipal composting facility. But in year two, as you can see in some of these images in the second column, um, those big stands that we've been able to get out and treat are, are usually significantly smaller. And so we can then get uh, you know, uh, people back out to, uh, to continue because they see some success from their previous years of effort. And by the time we get to a year three type of uh, a program, um, the stems usually are further and, uh, and uh, far less dense, and uh, it just becomes easier and easier and easier each year of the program to go back and treat that uh, same site. So there are significant uh, improvements that we see uh, in this program, which is significantly uh, dependent on 
cutting the stems below the water line and allowing the, uh, the water to flood and drown the plant out. Um, when these stems are on shore, there's slightly different techniques that we use and they can be a little more resilient, but the stems in the water, typically we see about an 80% reduction in the first year. This is a picture of uh, Heather that she shared uh, with me and uh, a person that she recruited in her community in year four to go out to uh, what used to be in year one, a, a large stand. And you can see they only ended up with two small bundles by year four. And in year five, there's just really, you know, hardly any of the uh, invasive plant left. We've gone in and, and removed it uh, in a very specific way. The rest of the biodiversity is uh, left intact and the coastal wetland has, uh, you know, reestablished itself with its full biodiversity complement. So it's a successful program, but as you can see, it takes a number of, of years of effort uh, to go back to the same sites and do the cutting uh, year over year. Um, this is an image of, of the truck source, which uh, Janice uh, manages. And, and these are amazing machines that can uh, kind of floating tractors that can get out into uh, the more difficult stands where uh, volunteer citizens, it just might not be safe or productive for them to get out and uh, cut. So we have employed these uh, pieces of equipment over the years in a variety of locations where the stand density is, is uh, beyond uh, volunteer capabilities. Um, these images uh, here show the mapping that we've done uh, specifically between 2019 and 2020. And what you can see is the red dots are areas where we had mapped stands. The uh, green dots are areas that we managed to go out and treat. And the yellow dots are areas that are in uh, uh, or sorry, the green dots are the eradicated and the yellow dots are the, uh, we've, we've done a control uh, cut, but we then need to go back and probably do a second cut or a third cut to, in those locations. And the nice thing that you'll note in the southeastern portion of Georgian Bay that we're showing here, basically from, uh, from Point O'Barrel all the way south through Port Severn and Midland, uh, is that the red dots are disappearing. We're seeing more uh, of the green dots emerging, which means uh, we're just monitoring those sites to make sure that the plant doesn't come back. And you can see that the amount of eradicated has changed markedly over the years. But even when we go in and do the first cut, the size of those uh, sites is diminished. And so they do, as I mentioned, become uh, much easier to manage in year two and year three and year four. We don't view this as a perennial, you know, job creation program. Uh, we really would like to see this uh, plant removed and eradicated. Uh, it is possible to do it. We, we feel that we've been doing enough work over the last decade, certainly in the coastline, that it hasn't become uh, gone out of control. Um, and there's a lot of work that Janice will speak to uh, in other portions of uh, the province and a lot of focus on this. So it just shows that we really need to move upstream now and make sure that the vectors for reintroduction of this invasive species are also removed and so that we don't have these perpetual uh, um, infestations happening along the coastline. Uh, there is some uh, Phragmites treatments that have started to happen along uh, the major highways with the MTO that I'll let uh, James speak about, of course, and we're, we're very happy to see that. Um, so I will just in, indicate that there are a number of regions that kind of intersect in, in the Georgian Bay area, uh, the area that we're speaking about. We've got central region and the northeast uh, region, which are uh, two of the five uh, MTO regions. And then also kind of from Collingwood over to the uh, west, we've got the western region, uh, which borders in our Georgian Bay area as well. So you can uh, look at the map and figure out where your municipality is located here, uh, if you don't already know, but uh, um, James will speak more about uh, the MTO's program. So really the, the big picture here is that we would like to get uh, all of the, by 2025, we'd like to have treated all of the uh, sites. We'd like all of our Georgian Bay sites to have been treated and eradicated. We are on track uh, to do that. We recognize there is still a lot of work to do, but, uh, but we are, working on that program. Uh, but if we go into a perpetual uh, whack-a-mole uh, where we have to keep uh, fighting back re reintroductions of this plant, um, it would be an unproductive use of resources into the future. So it is our program now. We used to kind of talk about Phragmites management, but we now talk about actual Phragmites eradication 
uh, on the coastline of uh, Georgian Bay, and we're well on our way to achieving that goal, as I mentioned, with the municipal support, uh, the community support, uh, and some provincial and federal uh, programs that we've been able to tap into. So we're happy to kind of share this uh, program with you uh, to let you know the work that is actually underway, and also to show you the investment that's at risk if we don't take wider action and ensure that the roadways and uh, all of the mapping that uh, that uh, Bill will show you uh, is you know addressed and taken care of. And that's something uh, that we would like to leave you with as kind of, uh, I guess, motivation for your own work and your own programs. Uh, what you do will definitely have an impact and help uh, all of these precious uh, internationally significant uh, coastal wetlands. Um, they're unique in the archipelago. They support uh, many threatened and endangered species, and we'd really appreciate uh, your assistance in addressing this uh, wider threat. Uh, when we look at this uh, kind of impact, we have to remember that, that there are entities on this planet uh, besides the humans, uh, us humans that are here. And as Heather mentioned, when we think about the land and, and the medicines that are there for First Nations and our other winged and furry and swimmers and, and uh, crawlers that are on the planet, um, these may become lethal impediments to the life cycles of those organisms. So that will be helpful as well. And uh, we can all work together to try to create this uh, you know, diverse, uh, biodiverse, healthy wetland space. If anybody enjoys fishing in Georgian Bay, you, you need to have these wetlands there in order to enjoy fishing or any of the other clean water and resources that uh, you might find uh, enjoyable. So I would like to you know, thank everybody who's participating today for your time. Uh, as a brief introduction, I hope I've laid out kind of a sense of what uh, a charity is doing and what the community is doing itself and thank all of our partners and funders of these programs. And, uh, and really thank the, the donors of Georgian Bay Forever, our passionate friends and all of you who are here today to learn about uh, uh, techniques and eradications and uh, methodologies that you can uh, employ in your own municipalities. And with that, I would like to stop sharing my screen and introduce uh, Dr. Janice Gilbert. It's my pleasure having worked with uh, Janice for a number of years, uh, probably getting close almost to that decade now, it's hard to believe, but uh, yeah, Janice is a wetland ecologist, an expert in invasive Phragmites uh, uh, management, well over probably 20 years now of experience in, uh, in dealing with this plant and, uh, and researching and monitoring and managing uh, this hazard. Janice has a PhD in environmental science from Ohio State University. She has degrees in environmental sciences also from University of Waterloo. She's uh, established the Ontario Phragmites Working Group and uh, is the science advisor for the Great Lakes uh, Phragmites Collaborative from the, the commission, Great Lakes Commission. And Janice has also been a contributor in the development of uh, Ontario's Invasive Phragmites Best Management Practices Guides uh, and Road Guide Best Management Documents. She's frequently contacted by the province and municipalities, uh, City of London, for example, to tell them how they can manage this uh, plant. She's uh, currently managing the Invasive Phragmites Control Center, which is a nonprofit organization. And uh, she is who we work with uh, when you see those truckers out in the field. So over to Janice. Thank you very much, David, for that lovely introduction. And I always just so love your presentations on the work going on in Georgia Bay. It's just phenomenal. And kudos to your organization, all your partners, and all the volunteers. That's really, really encouraging to see that work. I'm going to share my screen now. A, a lot of what <laughs> we've uh, talked about. Um, let's see here. Where are we going? Um, oops. I, I'm going to reiterate. Can you see my screen? Yep. Awesome. OK. Is it in presentation mode for you? It is not yet, Janice, but we can see your screen. All right, so I'm just gonna go back one step. Sorry, this always works really well when I'm uh, practicing. And 
Let me just put this here. There, how's that? You got it. Which which screen? Can you see the, the main screen with presentation? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, so thanks again for the invitation to speak today. I, I, I am delighted to, to be here to provide some information. This is what I thought I would talk about. There was already a little bit of information about the plan itself, but I, I will elaborate a bit more and then uh, as well as the control concerns. And then talk about some of the control options that we're utilizing that are pretty effective. And then I'm gonna speak specifically about roadside control because there's a lot of information there that may be of use for folks who are actually doing the work or are gonna be contracting out this work. And then I just wanna highlight some initiatives going on in the province that you may not be aware of. So basically we're talking about the invasive Phragmites, common reed or giant reed, most of us just call it Phrag. Uh, but we do have native Phragmites on the landscape as well. So that's important to, to know. And, and the, this invasive strain was actually um, first identified uh, through Genesis work, uh, Kristen Saltonstall in, in the early 2000s. And basically uh, we now know we have this invasive strain from Europe. Um, it's um, known as a haplotype M. And the early literature actually has it as a subspecies Australis. And Kristen has since uh, gone back to Europe to try and trace where it is. So, so basically, uh, as far as I know right now, it's not quite known the uh, origin of it for, for where it came uh, from in Europe. But so basically it's uh, Phragmites australis is a Latin name or a European common read more appropriate. But a scientist, uh, Paul Catling with Agriculture, Agri-Food Canada, um, actually identified Phragmites as Canada's worst invasive plant back in 2000. So here's native Phragmites, and you do have it up on your, your, in your area in, in some of the rows. It tends to behave itself more. You'll see there's some plants here with really shiny, shiny stems, and there's actually invasive Phragmites in, in the mix here as well. But our native Phragmites tends to, quote unquote, behave itself. It doesn't tend to grow monoculture. There is some information out there about how you can tell the difference, but basically if you see a really shiny stalk, Unless it's in water, invasive strain will have a shiny stock on water. Um, but basically, that's kind of what it, uh, one of the characteristics. This is invasive Phragmites just getting started on the shoreline, up in Oliphant. And it's at this point where you really want to get on it, well, even before it gets to this density. But this is really um, the tough part to get people to pay attention if they're not aware of how bad it can get. It's usually not till it gets to to this point, the people are paying attention. And at this point, that's a, it's a heck of a lot of work. This is just a little bit further on the Lake Huron shoreline in uh, Miss Pally of Kincard. And this stand is actually now gone, which is awesome. When I first started doing the work, um, <laughs> uh, this this is the first wetland I, I worked in. So really high biomass and, and, and height and all that. It, it's quite a crazy plant to, to be working in. It's a grass. And if we look at where it grows in Europe where it's a native plant, it actually grows monocultures. So it doesn't um, behave like our native frag here does. It doesn't behave itself. It actually it takes over a system. And But they're over there, they've evolved with for millennia. They're called reed beds. They're very highly um, um, valued ecosystems and all the wildlife have evolved, have evolved with them. But if, if you look, they have been there for like over a thousand years. So when people say to me, I'll just leave the frag alone, it, it'll, it'll uh, equilibrate out. It, it won't if we look at how it behaves in its natural environment. It has a lot of uh, mechanisms for spreading too, from seeds and any viable plant parts. And when they land on moist exposed sediment, that's when they can get um, started. So here's an example of one of those feathery seed heads we see out now in the landscape along the roads and elsewhere. About 2,000 seeds per seed head. Viability, if it's just a single clone that hasn't cross-pollinated, is about a, a 1%, which is still a lot of seeds, actually. Or, and it can get as high as 40% viability if they've cross-pollinated with a, a different genetic uh, parent. And so the, the seeds land in the water, and then they can start to sprout and germinate. So this usually happens in the, in the spring. And then if you think about the, along the Lake, uh, Lake Huron shoreline or any of the Great Lakes where Phragmites is established, and you have these uh, storm events, and if you just wash out all these viable plant parts and they'll relocate along the shoreline, it's just gonna take a long time for us to get it off of the Great Lakes, line, but it definitely is, is doable. Here's just one of those little parts that's broken off and, and starting to sprout. Or if the stalks land in the water, 
it can start uh, a root and a, and a shoot right at each of the nodes. So it can even spread that way. And uh, I call it the zombie plant because when you, you think it's dead, it still has viable plant parts. So this is a bunch of dead material that's rolled up on the shoreline. The ice ripped it out during the winter. And then, and then when the ice melted, the, the waves pushed it into shore. And there's still some viable plant material in what we thought would have been dead from previous years. So basically, once any of these viable plant parts get established, so a seedling or, or, or the roots, if they start growing in, in, the, in the sediment and get established, it all happens below the ground, it's spreading. Um, and they're all, they're all related to each other. It's a clonal plant. And you get really high densities. And, and the below ground structures can go really deep in the sediment as well. And basically, once it gets established, it's, it's exponential growth for this plant. So here's just the side profile of one of those high density stands. This is what would be happening below ground. So lots of roots and, and rhizome material. And here's an example of that exponential growth. So this is from one uh, parent stalk that's in amidst, amidst uh, our native um, wetland plants in there. And this is what it's sending out during the growing season. This is usually occurring below ground, but sometimes you can see it above, called the stolen above ground. And about every 30 centimeters, you have a new root and you have a new shoot. And uh, this was quite long and that was still in August. So it still had some growing to do. So once those, uh, each of those get um, set into the sediment, they become a parent stalk. So that's your exponential growth. The plant has uh, adaptability for wide uh, um, habitat conditions. It can survive the brackish water and the seaboard. That's why it does really well in our roadside ditches. Where there's had a harsh winter and lots of low salt. Doesn't seem to bother it at all. And variable water depths, and we're seeing this uh, with the Great Lakes rising, it can go in below for a meter and a half deep water. Low high nutrient sites doesn't seem to matter either and a variable pH. And, and so it's basically an exceedingly adaptable plant. So here's one of the strategies it can use for uh, deeper water. It sends up what's called adventitious roots at the, each of the nodes. So the feathery roots allow it to, to absorb the oxygen that's in the water column, which is about 10,000 times lower than you would in, in the atmosphere. Or it can send the stolons across the water, doesn't matter how deep the water is until it reaches the moist sediment on the other side. And here's the other extreme where it can uh, grow in really uh, hot, dry conditions like a sandbar because it can send the roots down to get the water and nutrients. It's a really strong competitor for nutrients. And, and as David mentioned, it has aliopathic uh, uh, characteristics as well. It sends out chemicals at the root. So, so basically, um, there's no, no, no native plant that can keep it at bay. It can outcompete cattail and, and even willow button bush. So basically, once it gets established and, and gets going and it's not kept in check, it'll, it'll just keep expanding. And, and basically, there's no, no natural controls on the landscape. The only control is humans. It, that would be important just to kind of look at the history of spread uh, throughout Canada. This is a really neat study that came out by Paul Catling and Giselle Matro in, in, in 2011. So basically they went and looked at herbarium specimens and um, all across the country to try and track its spread. And it started on the Eastern seaboard, Nova Scotia, in the early 1900s and by the 1910s had moved up to St. Lawrence, Quebec and Montreal. And the first known specimens in Ontario were down Walpole Island. And then in the 1970s, there was more localized spread of the plant. In the 1990s, it actually really, really took off, particularly in Southern Ontario. By the end of the study, um, it had moved up north, Northern, Northern Ontario and, and was heading heading um, west as well. And they did a prediction of where it could be with climate change scenarios. And this is actually now conservative because we know that it's actually further north than what they predicted. These red dots show its uh, known occurrence. This is from uh, Miles Falk in the, in the US. And you can see there's gaps. We know it's up in the Bruce Peninsula and there, or there's a lot of question marks there. It's certainly, there's a, certainly a lot more red dots, but. Basically, it's a huge issue on the Great Lakes. And the IJC, for the first time in the report two years ago, mentioned Phragmites. So it's a binational issue. There's a binational group, Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative. Uh, um, I'm a part of it, as are other folks from Ontario, um, some Ontario government folks from, on that group now. And, and basically trying to keep um, 
communication channels open and, and information sharing and, and trying to have a concerted effort going uh, on the Great Lakes. And, and Ontario is certainly playing a huge role in this. Um, so um, mention about it spreading around in the 1990s and in the United States, that's when it was first becoming um, a problem. And there was a lot of research looking at why is it spreading around so much? So a lot of studies pointed to increased disturbance on the landscape. So a lot more naturalized areas were um, having um, development and urbanization and more nutrients in the landscape. And even our creeks and streams are flashier because there's less natural areas to absorb the, the rain, a lot more pavement, a lot more exposed moist sediment uh, happening. But this was a really neat study that came out and this has already been mentioned. Um, a direct link to, to uh, the development of transportation corridors and the spread of Phragmites, this was in Quebec. So um, there's your direct link where um, there's construction activity going on on, on the highways and, and Phragmites was, was spreading. And we also now know it's not just roads, it's also rail lines and hydro corridors. It's all those transportation and, and pipeline corridors that are also um, um, major spread vectors. The Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation undertook an assessment of Phragmites on Lake Huron from uh, Sarnia to Wyerton back in 2011. And, and what Karen Alexander, she did that study assessment, what she found was well, there's new pioneer populations just starting on the Lake Huron shoreline. It was invariably at a creek mouth or a stream um, right at the uh, uh, lake edge. And if she went up into the watershed, she saw Frag. In a, in a roadside ditch or an agricultural ditch that was flowing into the lake. And this was mentioned before. Uh, this is a major spread vector. Early in the when I first started, he was, I thought the Minister of Transportation was actually planting frag because wherever there was new construction, up would pop the frag. Uh, but anyway, it, it's, and this is like, you know, common sense. The equipment goes in, does its work, loads on a flatbed trailer and off it goes to the next site and it doesn't get clean. So it, it's been spread, these, uh, Activities have been spreading Phragmites around our roadsides. And in Southern Ontario, it's not uncommon to see Phragmites in a lot of communities. And where we're, I'm not seeing it, I know there's a program going on. Uh, this, this particular stand in my neck of the woods, Norfolk County is now pretty much, pretty much gone. I get so upset when I get up into Northern Ontario and see it along the highways up there because I just know what's gonna be happening up north. So I know James is gonna be talking about this. Um, but yeah, these are major, major uh, spread corridors. It's also a really big issue uh, where it's been on the landscape longest. I mentioned down Walpole Island, the uh, frag was down there since the 50s. So if you go down to Windsor, Sarnia, all these areas down here now, it's been here a long time. You see it in, in the agricultural ditches. So it has been causing an issue now for farmers. Water can't get off the, the land and, and um, it's, it's causing issues with with the crop production. So I know on the Ontario Federation of um, the um, Agriculture, uh, they're definitely um, looking at this. This is an example down in the Sarnia. This, this has pretty much been controlled now, but Lake Huron is not too far downstream from, from this particular site. This is another uh, way it's being spread, uh, ATV use into these more naturalized areas back, back into the woods. Uh, these wetlands when they were dry out, particularly this happened a lot when the lake levels were lower. I'm seeing a lot of ATV activity along the shorelines in these, these coastal wetlands. So that's an issue in itself. But in terms of spreading the Phragmites, absolutely no question. This big wetland system here, I was able to track Phragmites well in a kilometer in from the shoreline. These, these vehicles had gone in through the Phrag and, and taken it right into the, the coastal wetland. A lot of rare plants in there. So some of these concerns have already been mentioned and I'll, I'll just go over them again. Uh, huge impacts for recreational opportunities where Phragmites has overtaken the shoreline. Areas where, where birders traditionally would have gone, there's no, no way to, no sight lights, lines gone or the access to the shoreline for, for canoeing or, or fishing, that opportunity is gone. These are real impacts that have been happening. Certainly in areas that rely on the, on the coastlines uh, for bringing in tourists have been impacted. And the property values as well. Um, this happened on uh, Lampton Shores area and also Cape Garden. High value homes or cottages right on the lake, but they can't see the lake. They can't access the lake. So they're paying high taxes, but um, there's no, no uh, value for them to be on the shoreline. Damage to the infrastructure. Uh, the photo was already shown about uh, the asphalt 
roads and, and hydro corridors. This is an issue in the dormant period where there's there can be fires that can interact with the, the flow of um, the electricity. And also there can be liability issues, particularly in urban areas or areas where there's uh, dry frag mice, particularly this time of year near residences and um, or if it's growing it in uh, roadside ditches at intersections, there's been some horrific uh, car accidents because of, of the sightline blockage. So this image here, uh, Murray Purcell, when he was with the Ontario District Transportation, he's now retired. Um, he showed this to his managers and this is how he got uptake in MTO to start dealing with pragmatis. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, it, it does uh, cause some infrastructure damage. The city of St. Thomas residents there had a situation very similar to what you see in the, these images, the top left, uh, Phragmites uh, growing or, or around a, a city pond and they, um, the city was approached to deal with it because of concerns with fire. And so that started the ball rolling for uh, uh, a, a kitty. And they've since uh, two years ago, um, they said that they have now eradicated in the city of St. Thomas. The city actually just went ahead and dealt with it. it didn't matter if it's on city property or private lands, they dealt with it citywide and on all the roads. So if you wanna see a spectacular fire, you can Google Fried Mighty's Fires. This one was on a golf course. It burns really hot and really fast. Uh, so you do not want these occurring uh, in, in uh, your, your uh, neck of the woods if you can at all avoid it. And David mentioned the impact on wetlands, and this is why I became so passionately involved in dealing with Pragmites. I was assessing coastal wetland in Toronto Provincial Park back in 2005, and I get into the middle of these massive Pragmites stands and spend the whole day in them. Man, this is a problem. And really no one was talking about it at that time. Uh, so the, the wildlife, we use the edges, but you get into the middle and they're just, uh, I call them dead zones. There's no evidence of wildlife use, no, no tracks or scat or nests. And so there's a lot of habitat that's being lost because of this plant. And so the impacts on the wildlife, particularly the ones that are dependent on, on these wetlands for a um, portion of their life cycle, or all portions of their life cycle are impacted. And a lot of them are, are species at risk. Uh, so significant impacts to these particular wildlands. So we have a problem. How are we dealing with it? So I'm gonna just talk about these two approaches because in my mind, they're, they're both the most effective ones that we're using in Ontario. One is the cutting to drown, which David already talked about, and then the other is the chemical. And with the cutting to, to drown, um, there's a lot of work that the volunteers are doing and there's tools that they, can, they are using, can be using to deal with the, the lower density Phragmites. Uh, we have some postcards out for both the spading method and the, the cane cutting. And actually I have an outreach program through the IPCC where I, I supply these uh, tools from Lee Valley. They're not that expensive, they're about $28. They're, they're in a telescopic um, hole and they help with the fine tuning, uh, collectively harvesting Phragmites amongst our native plants. But uh, we sell them for $15 and that's a, a partnership with Bruce Power um, if anyone's interested. But uh, so far we've, <laughs> We've uh, sent out over nine, 900 of the units. So that's, that's pretty cool. There's a lot of fraggers out there using this. The other, the other one that we use is um, the still gas cutters. And I know Georgian Bay forever use these. So some of our um, the volunteers have bought them. Um, my crew use them. They're not meant for water, but if they're properly maintained, they work forever. Uh, my units are, some of them are six years old now. I'm actually gonna put together a postcard about this and I'm going to have a little video that my mechanic's going to do for me to, to show people how to actually maintain these because I know some unfortunately some cottagers there <laughs> they didn't know how to maintain them properly and they sneak from them but anyway uh, uh that's going to be coming but uh those that those tools are really handy when you have about a 70 percent density and you've got lots of manpower and here's an example where we manually control some pragmites but at some point, the density is too high, even for those cutters and even for the most hardy of our, our fraggers out there. So, and, and also all the cut material has to come out. There's a lot of manual labor. And that's what was really the impetus for me to get the invasive Phragmites control system started to help people deal with Phragmites. Uh, there's a huge gap in the province. So um, basically I have a, a trucks for cutting program. I also have manual program and also a herbicide application program as well. And, and outreach and all that. But 
we now have three of these machines. And basically, as, as David showed, we, they, the utilization is really, really uh, of value in these high density stands for not only cutting, but removing the pragmites. And there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot to this. There's, there's a, a timing issue uh, for um, reducing impact on the, on the wildlife that may be using the, the, the pragmites. There's a fish spawning regulation issues and all that. So the timing window for actually dealing with pragmites in these natural areas is very tight. You can't start to the middle of July. Um, and of course, there's always uh, wind and wave and action and all that fun stuff to deal with storms. Our, our crew are really experienced in, and there's a lot of site logistics that have to be worked out ahead of time as well. It's not just a matter of taking the machine in and cutting the pragmites. And I just want to point out that, that even in roadside ditches, uh, the birds will nest, they'll use the structure if it's left there, particularly in the higher density pragmites. So that is a consideration even in roads or, or what's considered industrial like sites like stormwater management ponds. Uh, that should be a consideration always that wildlife are using whatever habitat are, is available to them to nest in as well. There are a lot of projects going on in, in the province right now. These are just the ones I'm aware of that's using the, taking advantage of the high lake levels, using the cutting to drown um, methods. And I don't have very many dots for, for where you guys are. They were just placeholders, but I know there's that, that whole shoreline would be covered in red dots. But I just wanna be aware there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, groups working on the landscape out there. Some of these projects are really large and some, and some are quite small. And I just want to highlight a few. One on uh, Manitoulin Island, headed up by Judith Jones. She basically mapped pragmites on the whole island. And she's got a crew going, dealing with it, either with backpacks, sprayers, uh, herbicide use, or in the dry areas, or uh, manually cutting. And she brought us in to help deal with some of the massive stands. And so this is just one example. This is Michael's Bay, it was several kilometers, really high density pragmites. She was able to get um, the uh, township of uh, Takama as in kind to truck away the, the biomass for us. And, and we use the barges to do that. And so basically that whole shoreline now is, um, it, it can be controlled manually. Uh, just um, last year, Judith said they hardly had to spend any time at all on, on that. Another example is an olifant. This is a massive, massive area. So it was socked in with Pragmites. Big program going on headed up by a volunteer, Leslie Wood. And uh, basically um, we go up every year with our truck source to help out. Leslie is really successful in getting a lot of partnerships, particularly the town of South Bruce. They put this bin on the shore for, for the cottagers and the volunteers to use and they, they um, will truck it away once it's filled up. I think last year they, they took it away six times for them. And as mentioned, uh, they bring us up to help them with the massive stands and we work with their volunteers. And a lot of their volunteers, they bought their own saws as well. They call themselves old guys with saws and they come up for an hour and cut away. And they've got um, other volunteers come with the fine tuning around the native plants. And uh, lots of other volunteers help pick up the biomass. So lots of uh, efforts going on out there in the lower density stands. The trucks are focused on the higher density stands. And one of the, the council members for Council South Bruce, Paul McKenzie, he had a barge and he put a, a, a little um, mini backhoe on it. And uh, he uh, recruited his son and brother last year and a, another cottager to help us, just all in kind, to help us get rid of the biomass along with our, our crew's uh, barges and the trucksers. And uh, then as in kind, the town of South Bruce had a backhoe and uh, the dump trucks, they, they trucked away 168 tr uh, truckloads for us last year out of that site. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's a massive program, but when I first started in 2017, I remember standing on the government docks there looking out. It, it was the first uh, day we were getting started and there were some local people there and they're saying, why are they even bothering? Like, it, it's just too bad, you know, that it, it's, it's, it's pointless. And, and now they're looking out and seeing all this open water and there's more and more and more people uh, buying in and volunteering every year. So it's pretty uh, this is a site on uh, Lampton Shores shoreline. This is a, a camp. For years, uh, they they maybe reached seventy percent capacity. People that brought boats had to go elsewhere to launch them. The lake is out there somewhere. They put in a pool, so we came in and were able to clear the the shoreline with the trucksters for them. And for the first time in 2018, they, the kids are actually able to canoe and kayak. It's pretty cool. To see. 
So this is uh, what the shoreline looked like on dry areas. It was uh, treated with herbicide and the wet areas cleared it out with the truck course. And we're working way down in this area here as well. That shoreline, hopefully by the end of this year, will be all cleared up. This is the doppelganger. This is up, this Palladia Kincardin. Their horse, whole shoreline looked like this, 19 kilometers of shoreline. Just every single embayment just socked in with Phragmites. This was a campground. Uh, they hadn't seen the lake there in deck over a decade. So we were able to go in and clear it out for them as well. So right now, just the volunteers that come and camp, they'll go out with their, their cane cutters and clear it out. That whole uh, Kincardin shoreline, we've been working with them the last several years that it's systematically getting cleaned up as well. And I just want to uh, shout out to, uh, give a shout out to Georgian Bay forever for all of your efforts. I can't imagine what Georgian Bay would look like right now without the efforts that we've been putting in. It would be an absolute disaster zone. So thank you to you, to your organization, and all of the volunteers and all of the municipalities that are supporting this work. Um, it, it's been absolutely critical. And it's just so exciting to see those red dots turn to green. I'm going to switch over to uh, the other uh, methods that we're using for control. Th these are in dry land areas where we have herbicides available to deal with Phragmites responsibly. Right now in, in Ontario, we have these products, uh, WeatherMax, VisionMax, WeatherPro. Uh, they're glyphosate based with a surfactant added to them at the manufacturing state. WeatherPro actually is identical product to WeatherMax. They just <laughs> moved it into a different division of Bayer last year into their environmental division um, because uh, they wanted to have uh, a division that dealt specifically with its use in the industrial areas as opposed to industrial areas of agriculture. And I just heard the other day that Bayer is looking to sell this division, so I have no clue what's going on. Anyway, hopefully we still have those products available. The other product is Arsenal Power Line. It has a different active ingredient. It's a Mazapir, it's, and again, the surfactant added at the manufacturing stage for those reasons, these products are only uh, able to be used on dry land, not in water. It's a surfactant that's sufficient to deal with aquatic life. If we're using these herbicides in natural areas, we need what's called a letter of opinion. So it's basically approval by the, the provincial government to allow us to use the chemicals. If it's along a road or uh, if it's an industrial area, you don't need this, or if you're working with the conservation area or the Ministry of Natural Resources for that matter. And David alluded to this, finally, yay, just as of a few weeks ago, the Bayer pro or BASF product uh, Habitat Aqua is now available in Canada for uh, safe uh, overwater application to deal with Phragmites. So this is a huge deal. We still don't quite know yet what's happening with the permitting for this through uh, the Ministry of Environment, um, Conservation and Parks. We're hoping to get a workshop pulled together. This is the we is um, I approached the Ontario Invasive Plan Council under the Ontario Framework Working Group, hoping to have a workshop, have MOECP, -E MECP staff there to to, to uh, talk to us about the permitting process, so that anybody that that wants to use this product this year knows what that what it entails so uh, stay tuned for that there'll be some information coming up but i i do want to point out and you know this happens a lot i give a lot of presentations people are really leery about the herbicide use particularly in natural habitats and what i tell them because i've been doing this a long 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 time once you get rid of the phragmites the native plants will recover as do the insects and the wild they come in this stand here a really thick frag we sprayed it with the herbicide and here's a um, small um, milkweed the next growing season coming back. Other studies have, have shown the same thing, really good results. Um, there's been some monitoring going on in Long Point I'm gonna talk about. Uh, it's showing that no minimal impacts from insects and, and uh, the wildlife. So I'm now gonna talk specifically about roadside because there's uh, um, some information here that I'm hoping will be of value for those folks that are looking to deal with it on the roads. Cutting really isn't a long-term solution, but if it's your only solution, if you for some reason just can't use the herbicide, at least it reduces the stature of the plant. It'll thin it out a bit um, and it stops it from preventing or uh, developing a seed head. Um, so, but there's uh, you need specialized equipment if you aren't gonna be cutting it right from the beginning of the season right through, because it just grows so fast. Um, so. Uh, there's that consideration as well. And you have to cut everything. The, the thing I see with the, the cutting 
And I've seen this where folks have been using this uh, solely as a, a control method. It looks really good uh, if you've been cutting it for several years, but if you stop, the, the plant comes back with a vengeance within a couple of years. So just to keep that in mind. With the herbicide use, this is the most effective. Um, we tend to use the WeatherMax, the glyphosate-based herbicide. On the label, it has this rate. If you are contracting out, I would strongly recommend you put the high level on this because this is what Phragmites really needs to be uh, killed. Um, it's, it's a 5% solution. And we always add this methylated seed oil. This seems to be the secret ingredient. With Arsenal Power Line, it's about a half of uh, the concentration required. And again, we add the methylated seed oil as well, but you can add whatever surfactant you, you like. This is really important. Um, when I give talks to folks in the agriculture sector, they, they say, why don't you spray it with like it's a knee, knee high or thigh high? Why do you wait until it's so tall? Because for farmers, they go out and spray in the spring, right? Well, the reason is because you want to kill the below ground structures. And there's about two or three times more below ground than what you see above. So you want a lot of leaf surface to intercept that spray. And that's the reason why we wait later in the season. And in fact, if you can wait till the plant is actually translocating in the fall, that's actually the best time, but it also has a seed head on it as well at that time. So, you know, if you can start in, in uh, August uh, into, into September, October before the heavy frost, uh, those are a good time to spray. But you can also spray the end of June if you need to. If you are going to spray before the plant reaches peak biomass or height, um, it's it's maybe be a good idea to cut it down. This is a good time of year to get in and cut before the, the birds set up a nest because that way you're not spraying a lot of the dead cane as well when it's it's not quite reached its peak biomass. And these are just considerations. Anybody using herbicide needs to know this, should know this. Particularly in this, going into uh, September, October, where you have a heavy dew on the plants, don't be out there spraying. You have to wait till that dries off. And also, if it's really hot, humid day, the plant shut down. So you're just wasting your chemical. And here's the other piece, particularly for roads. Um, the whole cell needs to be targeted. And I know it sounds easy to me. <laughs> I know logistically it's not always easy. Here's just a, a really bad picture. Uh, I just want to illustrate the road allowance is here, but here's the frag back here. And usually this is all that gets dealt with. And there's no point moving this because it's just going to reinvade uh, your, your roadside. So it all has to be dealt with. So a program needs to be set up for that. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. So there's uh, various methods for applying the herbicide. Like you have a lot of uh, kilometers of really high density frag, you get the spray boom trucks, that there's other uh, pieces of equipment you can use if it's uh, um, different difficult terrain, all-terrain vehicles, even backpack sprayers as well. If you're using the WeatherMax, so the glyphosate, within about three, two to three weeks, you can actually see where you've, you've uh, sprayed on the plant and you can go back and do touch-up uh, that same year, right, right uh, a couple weeks afterward. Um, if you've gone back twice and the plants are still alive, you still have a few stragglers hanging on, we generally switch the uh, active ingredient and we'll use the amazapir product. And if you use this approach, you can actually eradicate the cell on a row within one year. If you can't, if you spray later in the season, um, you can and go back the second year. That's why you know you got up to about these three years. Depends on how how often you get back to that, that cell to deal with it. Arsenal power line behaves a little differently. You can spray it and the plants still look green all growing season. Um, so you can't really go back and do a touch up that year. And what also tends to happen is it weakens the stalks will actually fall down on their own. Um, but the thing with this particular product is you have to be exceedingly careful using it around trees. So um, if it gets near the drip line, even like go out to two times the drip line uh, to be careful because you can kill a mature tree even with a small amount of, of this product. So that's something to be uh, cognizant of if you're using this, this product. That's why we like to use it for touch up because it's just backpack and we're applying it right to the actual um, Phragmites stock. Cutting and herbicide, I'm putting this one up because this has been used. Uh, I don't recommend it. And so it's, it's called wet blade technology. So basically on this industrial blade, chemical um, gets put on the blade as it's cutting the stalk. 
So a little bit of chemical gets on the stem and it's not enough to kill all that below ground biomass. So you can achieve up to about 40% mortality. But you think about it, if you're doing this every year, um, you're gonna eventually um, make the plants resistant. So it, I'm not a, a strong advocate of this at all. And, uh, and that's why, but I wanted to put this up up there just to, to say that there are some people that are using this as a method and it and actually uh, worries me a bit. Excavation. I mentioned that there's a lot of below ground biomass and it goes really, really deep. So uh, you're, in some cases you're gonna have to go really deep to get it all. And what happens is if you just get a little bit, whatever you expose, it'll send up a shoot. So if at all possible, we recommend before construction work happens that, that the plants get sprayed first. And then any of the ex excavated material, if it can just be stockpiled somewhere, and if there's any re-sprouts, it can be easily be dealt with, just be sprayed on site, or it can be buried, um, uh, put a, a, a meter overburden. Uh, there was one industrial uh, site in London where they were going to put in a stormwater pond, so we treated what we could all around, and the area being excavated, they put a cap on, and uh, so there should there was no issues with with growth there. I just want to talk about a really interesting program. I think it's fantastic what's going on in the Sable Bayfield Conservation Authority. And I think this would be a really neat model across the, the province. Uh, in 2014, the county of Huron uh, approached them and said, can you take over dealing with the uh, Phragmites on our roads? And the reason for, they had in-house spraying capability, but they it was only budget every three years. And of course, with Phragmites, they're just, uh, as David said, just kind of a whack-a-mole. <laughs> you're spinning your wheels. So they hired the ABCA crew and they had uh, staff on, on crew that were, um, had, had their licenses, you know, forestry and dealing with other invasive plants. So it was a really nice fit. And uh, a lot of these crew, uh, they have uh, an uh, environmental background as well. So first thing first, you map it, figure out where it is, and then get a game plan together. And so they just put equipment on the back of a pickup truck. Um, this is a uh, just very typical uh, spraying equipment. And they also had backpack sprayers. And then um, they had a person driving and a person on the back walking and, and spraying or on the back of the pickup truck. And the neat thing is anybody that stopped to talk to them because they have a background in ecology or they've been doing this work at, to restore ecosystems, they can talk about the chemical and why they're doing the work. They also, because they're local and they went and assessed where the, the frag was along the roads, they knew which areas to, to be careful of with different wind directions and speed for not damaging crops or people's lawns. And, and on uh, days where the weather wasn't that great, they would drive around and, and, and get a game plan together. So very efficient. And um, also if um, they knew it was gonna be a high winds in the afternoon they, or hot, humid weather, they would know when to time, when to apply. And uh, they also, um, do enough to a heavy transport trucks wherever go, but just to stop spraying because that creates wind drift. Then they have a lot of monitoring going on as well. So um, anyway, really neat project. Uh, and lots of really good information here that that uh, can be shared. And and right now they've got all of the county roads controlled, just minor touch up. So basically, dealing with roads efficiently and effectively. Uh, Map, map where they are, you gotta know where they are. And I think Bill's gonna be talking about this. Are they in wet ditches or dry ditches? Are the wet ditches, do they dry out? And where are they located? Is, is there some uh, off, off of the, the road allowance, which then leads to the partnership. And this is really critical for roads because they cross so many jurisdictions. And this was kind of a, <laughs> I opened it up for me several years ago um, with uh, Nancy Bidler with Lampton Shores, Framers Community Group. There was a, a spray boom truck going along the, the road there. And was, oh, yay, the frag's getting dealt with. We got to an intersection, up went the boom, and they stopped spraying. I was like, well, why did you stop? Well, I was only contracted for the municipal roads, and this is a county road. I was like, you're kidding. This is an issue. So, you know, it's interesting. You don't, these little big things you don't even think about. Of course, it's easy to do roads, but there's some logistical uh, constraints there as well. So the partnership is really important. That's why having this workshop today is pretty cool. You guys are doing this. Uh, and if it's on adjacent lands, I, and I've talked to James about this. Invariably, it went from the road onto the private land. So why wouldn't the cost be borne by the municipality or MTO, whoever's dealing with it on the roads? Um, but still the landowners need to be uh, contacted. 
and let's prioritize because you're not going to be able to deal with all the frag. There's just so much of it. So this was actually mentioned. If it's grown beside a creek or a wetland or some water body, that to me would be a high, high priority site to, to deal with. And then the, the annual budgets, and these have to be in place for a long time. Like Miss Palladio of Concordon, dealing with them for six years now. Every year, a line item, $30,000. $30, it's right in their line item budget. budget. We know how much we've got to deal with uh, or work with to, to, to deal with uh, that area. And then track the efforts. And I love the mapping that Georgian Bay ever have, the, the red to the yellow to the green. That's excellent. You need to know, know that the work that's being done is, is working. This is also something else to consider, particularly if you're putting out tenders. This is happening in a lot of municipalities now. I know London's doing this. Put in that the equipment and actually MTO as well. The equipment needs to be cleaned. If it's going from an area where they were working in Phragmites and taking it to an uncontaminated area, um, that's just uh, makes a lot of sense. There's also a document the number of us put together a few years ago uh, that's available on the Ontario Phragmites uh, Working Group website. I believe MTO has a new one as well that's that's come out and it talks about even if you want to seed. So if you've sprayed an area really high density frag and there's no native plants coming up, you can reseed those areas. Um, so there's information on that. And also there's other information available. So if you are interested, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's lots of groups um, that have products out there. I don't know if you're aware, but there is an emergency use program going on in Long Point and uh, Rondo Pincho Park. So this is basically um, a big partnership with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, Nature Conservancy Canada, Ducks Unlimited Canada, Ontario Parks, Bird Studies Canada, and lots of other uh, organizations. And basically the Ministry of Natural Resources put in a permit to the Pest Management Regulatory Agency, Health Canada, to allow use of a product called Roundup Custom. It's just glyphosate. It's being used in the States for, for decades. And this is to deal with the Phragmites down in, in the Long Point area. And basically um, the permit's been in place since 2016, huge project going on. Uh, the chemical was applied using helicopters and ground application. Nature Conservancy have two marsh masters and Eric Giles, that's him on his machine, um, he has one. So it's a huge project going on. There's a lot of monitoring going on as well. Um, this is through Dr. Rebecca Rooney's lab, University of Waterloo, and really neat uh, information coming out of there showing no issues whatsoever with uh, the water, with the uh, insects, uh, and anything that people may be concerned with using the herbicide. I mentioned it's, there's a lot of groups involved. Um, there's a lot of information uh, being posted. They have, they have a dedicated website. Uh, this sign is posted down in Long Point. So I, I took this picture in front of the the Crown Marsh and it's time stamped. So people standing, it's a huge, uh, it's a four by eight uh, sign. And so this image, if you look behind the image is exactly where I took it, you can see the restored wetland. So, which is really cool. So that's just something to keep in mind because you can forget very quickly how bad the site looked before you did any control. Um, and then there's this Green Shovels Initiative. It's a coalition of these six organizations they went to the federal provincial government with 12 um, um, initiatives they, that um, to put forward to, to get shovels in the ground, green uh, environmental initiatives during the period of COVID. And what came back were two to be funded. And uh, one was development of the strategic framework for Phragmites management in Ontario. So we've been involved with that. It's providing a guiding framework we had a health uh, workshop. This was with Nature Conservancy of Canada, for the lead on this. And uh, there was a workshop hosted by the Invasive Plant Council and Georgian Bay Forever took part in that. So basically asking all the fraggers out there, like what, what's going on? How are things working for you? What are your handicap? What do you want to see happen in the province? Really great feedback. And a lot of that was, was put into this framework. We're hoping the next phase gets actually fun. One of the big things is that public education campaign that's been missing for Anyway, uh, this is the message that I tend to give, particularly when I go further north in the province, just don't ignore Phragmites because eventually you're, you're gonna have to deal with it. And in Southern Ontario, the message, like, like don't, don't say, uh, you know, just get discouraged and say it, it's too bad, we can't do anything because you can. Um, there's a lot of great progress going on. 
um, in areas where there's work taking place. And, and just um, a kudos to all those fraggers out there putting in thousands of hours every year volunteer time. Uh, if you have these groups in your neck of the woods, please support them because uh, they're just doing amazing work and it's all volunteer efforts. And in my mind, this is how it's gonna work long-term. We get rid of the massive stands, but these people that live in these communities and care about these coastal areas, they're the ones that are gonna maintain it long-term. They, they all have the knowledge and, the, and those tools to, to deal with. And with that, uh, I just wanna mention, I think this is our next Fred Mighty's. It's called Miscanthus Silvergrass. It, I've been watching it outcompete uh, Phragmites on the 402 the last six years now. I am noticing it more and more on the landscape. Highway 400 now has it. So if you have a road control program going on for dealing with Phragmites, I would strongly recommend that this plant also gets dealt with. Uh, it's going to be a, a problem. I'm seeing it going off, off the highway now into some naturalized areas. And that is my presentation. And unmute myself there for a minute. Janice, that was just excellent. Uh, we can't thank you enough for your pa passion and leadership on Phragmites in general for the province, for all of us, it is simply amazing. Uh, just a small thing that uh, somebody brought up in one of the chats. Uh, I think the letter of opinion comes from the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Is that correct? No. Okay. No. It, uh, so they just revised it, but it it goes through the Ministry of Natural Resources. Your, your um, district office is okay. where the applicants go to that. Okay, excellent. And we will be uh, taking questions more gen. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, if that's for the, the dryland application herbicides for Habitat Aqua, that probably is going to go through MECP because right now, like they have a permit in place for the uh, diquat that's used in um, to get rid of um, the submerged aquatic vegetation like that chemical is applied right into the water column to get rid of the, those plants around the marinas and cottages and that and that permit goes through MECP because it's an aquatic and so that may be the case for Habitat Aqua. Yes, we, okay. we don't know. I'm assuming that is, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, there's just one more question. We will be having a larger question section after a, another presentation where, you, we, where we can field some more questions for Dr. Gilbert. But what I will say is that uh, somebody asked what the last plant was called, and I'm sure I'm gonna butcher this. So I'll say the common name is silvergrass, but I think it's Macanthus. Is that correct? Yes, great. It's sold in nurseries and if people are planting it on their lawn and it's just escaping. It's a really pretty grass. Right. Okay, thank you so much, Janice. And we're just going to move on to our next speaker and then we'll go to a, a period of question and answers. Our next speaker is Bill Lougheed and he's the executive director of the Georgian Bay Land Trust. He shares a lifelong love and appreciation for Georgian Bay and is a scientist at heart and by training. And with that, I'm just gonna turn it over to you, Bill. Thank you very much. Just try and get my screen shared here. So my talk is going to be about the forgotten wetlands and the threat analysis on some of our forgotten wetlands. First of all, I want to thank our wonderful partners in the study who are lead partner in Nature Conservancy of Canada, Georgian Bay Biosphere, and community nominated party place partners, and our funders, the Eastern Georgian Bay Initiative, the GMI, the Canadian Wildlife Service, and Georgian Bay Land Trust donors. I just need to move some of the stuff out of my way. I just, my screen is blocked here, unfortunately. Uh, you can't see it. Maybe you can't see the very top. Just a minute. I'm just going to move this this guy out of the way. So when we look inland from our coast, we have 14,700 wetlands. Um, they're mostly connected hyd hydrologically. 
They filter and purify much of Georgian Bay's water on the eastern uh, <clears throat> watershed and they mitigate flood and they provide multiple ecosystem services. They're a major carbon sink when you start talking about climate change and most of our biodiversity on the shoreline uh, resides here. We have uh, the highest biodiversity of reptiles and amphibians in the country. The perimeter of these wetlands isn't small. It's 7,500 kilometers, almost twice the width of Canada. And unfortunately, this is where Phragmites will spread inland. Okay, right, right, here we go. So this was the area of our study, the Georgian Bay Biosphere uh, Reserve, uh, going from Port Severn up to the French River. And if we zoom in on this coast, this is very representative of the wetlands in green, a little connected by streams or small rivers. So you can see there's an incredible connectivity between these wetlands. So when we're talking about roads and proximity to these wetlands, you can see that it's pretty much impossible to take a road from this, from 400 into our coast without crossing a wetland. You would be very hard pressed to do it. So bottom line for that is where there are wetlands, there are roads, and where there are roads, there are wetlands for the most part. The vectors for Phragmites on our coastline are multifold. There is glacial um, geology that you can see on this yellow line down here. This is a probably was originally a fault. Um, and with glaciation, this is now sort of an interconnected lake river system. Another one along here that you can see going out 12 Mile Bay Road. There's another one coming down here. So these are natural corridors for Phragmite spread. The roads, of course, as Janice discussed, uh, you know, are, are vectors for uh, along the course of the road, but they're also transverse vectors into wetlands and other habitats. So as we see here, this is the North Tadnac provincially significant wetland here. And uh, we already have some patches here, poised on the edge of this, poised to, to spread into this. There are, uh, um, I guess the, the other message on this is, once in these wetlands, you can see from the connectivity uh, in streams like this one here are included in, the, in this, you can see how once it gets into a wetland like this, it's going to continue to spread and you are going to have real trouble getting access to it and getting rid of it. So we have located uh, in the fall of uh, last year, we located 350 locations of invasive Phragmites and canary grass within the biosphere, 102 stands of Phragmites patches on the 400 highway. Not all of these are sprayed. Uh, there has been considerable work done and we're happy to see that, uh, but uh, not all of the, the spraying certainly didn't take on all of the stands, not the ones that we saw in the fall. After doing the field work, we got to um, busy mapping this on our ArcGIS system. Basically the global information system software packages that are out now allow you to do very sophisticated plotting and very sophisticated analysis. So we plotted the um, all of the Phragmites uh, locations and ranked them as you can see in this slide by patch size. Okay, so this is just a higher res view of the um, magnification view of, of the past slide. So you can see the different um, ratings of uh, the Phragmites. That's a 400 highway on your right there. So the sophisticated uh, GIS software will not, allows us to do all sorts of analysis. And so these are, this is an area, uh, uh, same area you were looking at, but here are the wetlands involved are ranked by Jenks uh, mathematical ranking. And Jenks ranks um, uh, things into different class sizes. So this, these are the wetlands ranked per size, which the blue are small wetlands, the yellow and, and green or medium-sized wetlands and the pink and, and red and orange or higher, larger wetlands.
And so we can take that ranking and then we can look at our Phragmites locations. You can see one there in red towards the right on the 12 Mall Bay Road, another one in blue further to the right, one in orange and uh, some off to the left are blue and an orange. And, and these of course are ranked from blue um, up to pink. And the, these are ranked according to threat based on wetland size. So this one here, this, this red dot here, it's adjacent to a fairly large wetland. So it's getting that high uh, threat ranking. This guy over here, this blue over here is very small wetland. This one over here, very small wetland. So it's given a lower priority ranking. We also went in and we overlaid uh, ranked both on wetland size and on patch size. And that gives a cumulative score of the effect of the patch size as per threat and the wetlands size as per threat. So that's that combined weighted uh, an, analysis allows an overall ranking, which we're going to provide to uh, the partners here on this webinar. I wanna just comment uh, further to what Janet had to say, Janice had to say is that these wetlands are all connected by streams and they're all flowing in one direction and that direction is west into Georgian Bay. Another comment about you know, uh, GIS analytical modeling, uh, these tools have become so much more powerful in the last five years and things like gypsy moth and jack pine budworm, these invasives can be tracked with this technology. We're tracking them at the land trust. And uh, you know that kind of threat analysis is something else that the township probably needs information on if they don't already have it. Sorry, it's a bit off topic, but somewhat on topic. The study outcomes, uh, from this uh, study with NCC and, and our other partners is that Phragmites, Phragmites threat to large inland wetlands is now priori prioritized to allow immediate action at those locations. Most patches are less than 100 uh, square meters and the spread at present is less than 50 meters into most wetlands. This, this work allows cost savings to townships and the MTO uh, it can prioritize spending based on science-based threat analysis, as I've shown you. The modeling helps minimize spread and maximize retention of healthy wetland ecosystems. And going forward, live GIS monitoring ensures early detection. In terms of study deliverables, live GIS, GIS mapping layers to be delivered to the township and the MTO, in-depth uh, presentations to townships and MTO of threat data, threat maps and a list of priority sites, which we have now for conservation action. Coordinates of all invasive locations and year over year, uh, our grant with NCC was the lead on that grant. We'll be providing this information uh, for three more years, I believe on that grant. The good news is in early days in terms of inland fragmites for the most part, or, or a few really worrisome stands especially near some of our river systems uh, off the 400. There are a few stands there that are really fairly serious vectors. But for the most part, spread in, wet, in wetlands is minimal. But as we all know, the time for action now, and you know, if you go and remember the other slides I showed in terms of the wetland connectivity and the percent of our inland spaces that are wetlands, it is a disaster waiting to happen unless we do something about it. So thank you all and thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Thanks so much, Bill. And I'm sorry uh, we've all been through that, that kind of frustration, but your data is so excellent. And the one thing that I want to add on to that is um, Bill shared with us that in the stretch of highway that they've measured, on the 400, they've already sort of mapped 102 stands on the on that small stretch of the 400, and I believe within your roads, uh, the roads that you've mapped, something like 248 of that includes invasive Phragmites and canary grass. So, so some really rich data. 
Um, so that was just excellent, Bill. Uh, at this point, I'd like to thank, again, all the speakers, phenomenal, for the first part of the session. And we're going to move into some uh, questions and answers. And I want to introduce Brooke Harrison. She's our uh, coordinator, a very busy person on Fragmites and our Divert and Capture program. And she's going to um, pose some of the questions to the panel. Go ahead, Brooke. Hi everyone, thank you. Um, so we, we briefly chatted on this, but there was the question about the letter of opinions and to build on that, what type of spraying license do you require for spraying frag on the shoreline and roadsides with Habitat Aqua? So I don't know if Janice has an answer for that. Um, but before we do answer that, I will just say if anyone does have questions, just uh, you can put them in the Q&A section now and I will read them out to Janice or Bill or David. Yeah, for Habitat Aqua, you're going to need your aquatic exterminator's license plus um, a commercial license if you're doing it for um, money. And you're going to have to have all the proper uh, insurance and all that coverage as well. So this project is not available to just anyone, uh, landowners, for instance. Like it's not like you can go into the TSC or the Canadian Tire and buy a, a jug of this. That's not going to happen. It's, it's, it's a restricted product. So only those folks that have the proper uh, qualifications are gonna be able to use it, which is awesome. So they, they're gonna have constraints on that for sure. Uh, so uh, uh, folks that are familiar with, uh, that are commercial applicators, they are, they are already gonna know uh, what's required in terms of the commercial licensing and, and the insurance. The additional piece for that is the aquatic exterminators. And then the other piece is, is the permits. What, the, what's going to be required for the permit? Great, thanks, Janice. Uh, another question is, and I feel like this is the question that we personally always get, and there's no set answer, but we can kind of start the conversation: is how and where do we dispose of everything? Do we dispose of the biomass? Yeah. So I, I mentioned Olifant, where the the township took away all like 168 dump truck loads plus they're taking away what the community is, is going to the shore there. Uh, it depends. A lot of areas, um, they, the municipality uh, is dealing with it as in kind. They take it to their landfill, they put it, they stockpile it. Once it's dry, it's not viable anymore. Um, so that's, that's one thing to be aware of. Uh, on some sites where the trucks work, work, we're leaving it in the system itself. It's creating structure for the wildlife. It dries out and it's not an issue whatsoever. It's actually facilitating um, helping uh, with the wildlife in use until the native plants grow back. Um, in other areas, uh, dry uh, fields, we're spreading it in fields and burning it, burn permits. So it all depends on, on where you are and your location, but municipalities certainly are helping in a lot of these communities. This probably can garden is in kind. They, they truck it away. Um, uh, is in kind as well. So a lot of municipalities are just doing that for, for us, for our trucks we're cutting for. For private landowners, a smaller amount, I think it showed one of your slides, uh, David, where some of the, if, if it's suitable, they can just burn it in an area where, where it's uh, um, not going to cause an issue. Um, and, and some areas you can haul it up off out of the water in an area, just let it dry, it's more won't spread. Uh, to keep an eye on it, maybe carpet or get it up, up out of the water. And just make a pile and just keep an eye on it. Yeah, and if there's any sprouts that happen, uh, you can just pull the sprouts. Out. Yeah, as Janice yeah. is saying, uh, drying it out is important. So there's some uh, locations in the outer islands of Georgian Bay where it's not practical to, you know, boat it back into shore. So we dry it up out of the water, uh, make sure it's dry in an area that's going to be dry, and then we just go back and monitor and make sure that none of the sprouts uh, are viable. And and if so, then we just cut them off and and dry them out. So, and it's been successful. We haven't had any reintroductions uh, based on that. Earlier, we were trying to, you know, carefully bag and net and drag everything over to a, a shore structure and then take it to a municipal composting facility to get the temperature up to kill any of the uh, viability in the plant. But we, we found that that's not necessary um, and that uh, just proper monitoring and drying it out is the real critical piece. And this time of year, if there's folks out and they've got a small patch, they can get those paper yard waste bags working used with um, just uh, pruners, snip the head off, put it in the bag, clean the seeds, and that can be burned. So 
Um, um, but yeah, as David said, like there's not an issue with it. Uh, once it dries out, it's it's it's, it's dead. It's not a problem. I think the the next there's I'll kind of combine a few questions here. Um, so there's there's questions about are we able to have access to the slides that were shared today um, and also information I know Janice you did share um, there is kind of a central location to go to but it's just is there a central location to go to kind of really gather all this information and then Scott just asked does anyone have a list of capable or recommended contractors to deal with these stands so I guess is there is there anywhere where we can all go to to get this knowledge to either start a program or contract out I'm going to start answering that one. Um, I will say that we are going to make a video available of this presentation um, and it'll show the slides in it, but I'm not going to make the slides available, but it, it will be shown in sequence with with the slides. So that information will be available. Um, I think I'll turn it over to Janice, Janice to talk a little bit about the resources that are available on the Unterrified Mighties Working Group site. Yes, there's, uh, yeah, we have a working group in the province. Lots of practitioners are, are uh, members of that group, as is the Georgia Bay Forever. Uh, we have a, a huge membership, actually. So there's really good information uh, that's Ontario centric that's on that website. So it's under the Ontario Invasive Plan Council. Another really good resource is that Great Lakes Frag Mighties Collaborative I mentioned. They have um, um, annual, or, or sorry, a bi-monthly updates on um, research that's come out new, new information. There's a lot of really good information there. Um, in terms of the application, it's US centric. So they have the Roundup Custom and they have the Habitat Aqua, which we're just gonna get. So that's mostly uh, how they control the frag there. In terms of the applicators, like for, for roadsides, um, there are a number of, of companies that do just roads. Um, and then for the natural areas, not so many. And we do know that that is a, a gap in the province in terms of rolling out a political strategy. There's going to need to be more, uh, more uh, people uh, doing this work. Uh, the Invasive Freight Mines, my, my entity does that work as well. Um, we try to focus on those areas that uh, are off of the roads, like in the natural areas to try to link the two. Um, but yeah, there are contractors out there and, and uh, I know that uh, that's why so when I provided that information in those slides and on the like if you're going to be putting out a tender there's certain pieces of information you want to make sure those contractors uh you have it in there so that they aren't using the, the lower amount of of chemical to save money or they're not coming back and not doing the touch up because that's pretty critical or if that's all you want them to do and you bring in another company to take care of that like there's a lot of considerations there for dealing with this response that's why I gave that ABCA example like if you have a local uh contractor that, that knows these areas and can go and deal with certain roads and certain wind bays to, to uh, reduce uh, in, uh, impacts of overspray and all that. That's the ideal situation. They can choose the weather and all that. So, um. so I, I think just to build on that, Janice, um, in the follow-up materials to this, I'll, I'll be sending some links to some of the relevant materials on the on, uh, Ontario Pragmites Working Group site. But also just that, I mean, because I've heard it before too, um, people ask me, do I know any contractors, et cetera. So it is, um, as you noted, there's a shortage of them and probably by a different region, there may be an even more acute shortage. So, you know, I think as part of the Ontario Working, uh, Fragmites Working Group and this group in general, we'll try to work on sort of lists and keep adding to them as we go so that, you know, that's available for people. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, that comes up a lot at the Ontario for Mines Working Group, and, and my pushback on that is, uh, how do you vet, right? I mean, how do you know these contracts, just because they have a chemical license and then they're out doing the work doesn't mean they're, they're necessarily good at it or doing it responsibly. So how do you, how do you vet that? And, and so um, sometimes it's word of mouth where the chemical companies themselves know who are the good ones and who, who aren't operating well. But that's a top one. And, and so how do you establish that, right? And so we've had lots of discussions around that. That's why I don't personally want a list on the Ontario for Mage Work Group website, because that means you're actually you're actually um, saying that these guys are okay when, when maybe they may not be, right? So that's that's why it's not there. Uh, there is a list on the Great Lakes Frag Mines Collaborative, and I push back on, on that one as well, because I said anyone can sign up to the list. Doesn't mean they know what the heck they're doing. So that's the problem. 
So we talked about that, like with NCC, with the provincial strategy, what would that look like in terms of having a program, a training program, particularly in, in sensitive habitat? That's really different if you're dealing with roads, really different or industrial land, right? So um, some kind of um, training and, and certification, that, that conversation is, is ongoing, what that might look like. As part of that, just as a follow-up question, is there a couple like uh, questions that would help people know how to vet these different contractors, possibly, that that a municipality might ask that might be helpful? Yeah, I guess I'd ask experience and maybe ask for um, some some former clients. Just get feedback on that. Um, ask their approach. How would they actually deal? So it's, you get their knowledge base. How if they actually know what to do and and if they know about the touch up and what's required that you know and what kind of equipment they use and and if they will actually walk to get out of the truck and they'll actually walk and use a backpack sprayer where it's required what do they do when they encounter those kinds of things what do they do when they encounter water um what would they say to a private landowner if they ask well, what the chemical and why they're doing this work like what kind of background is that knowledge that they have but those kinds of things um you really want to make sure particularly if it's a a program that the municipality is looking after. You want to have people that can speak to the general public to lay con uh, concerns about the herbicide. So that's critical. Like my crew work in a lot of urban areas and long foot paths and that, and they're constantly talking to the public. That's an important part of their job because that that at least alleviates the concern, but also for the client, the city doesn't get those complaints. That's that's pretty important to have, have that. That's why you know the conservation authorities. I don't know if you have any up here, but I mean, they have staff that are, this is just perfect for, for if that's available at all for, for you. Well, thank you, Janice. That was an excellent response. And I think that was very helpful. We uh, are now at break time. Um, so um, if uh, we'll shut, I mean, I'm not going to shut off, but we will, uh, if you want to go and get a coffee, Etc. We'll be back in at approximately 2:40 to uh, continue the webinar, and um, we'll look for you then. <laughs>